Fruity the Nine designed the Strider Clump as an inshore cruiser that would be easy yet fun to sail. 24 feet long, with a big cockpit and four berths, the Strider has shallow keels for windward work and can motor at six knots using a four horsepower outboard. Sailing Striders to the Baltic would be an ambitious trip, but we had sailed there before and enjoyed it. Sailing single-handed in a convoy of three boats would be both challenging and different, but we hoped it would also be more fun than all sailing in the same boat. I was sailing the red boat, Richard the blue one, while the yellow one was sailed by Stuart Fisher, who had sailed with us many times before, but this was to be his first long single-handed trip. The voyage needed careful planning as we wanted to visit as many countries as possible. So we decided on a circular route that would take us up the east coast of Sweden before sailing to Helsinki and Tallinn. We would return across the heart of Sweden by canal to Gothenburg before sailing back through Denmark to the Kiel Canal. We would be away for three months and so decided to finish the trip at my parents' home in North Holland. We left our home port of Plymouth at the end of May and set off across Lime Bay, past the Dorset coast and on up the channel. The weather was favourable and the sea smooth, so we soon settled into the routine of sailing by day and anchoring at night, because we planned never to sail more than 70 miles at a stretch. Sailing from Plymouth to Kiel single-handed in 24-foot catamarans is a good three weeks cruise, but for us it was to be just a stepping stone to the Baltic. We spent a couple of days in the Solent and then carried on until eventually we reached Dover and after a day's rest motor sailed off into the sunrise. Destination anywhere between Dunkirk and Zeebrugge. As usual the Dover Straits were very busy but the light winds made it easy to keep clear of all the shipping. The wind began to pick up as the sun rose and by mid-morning a light following wind had set in and with spinnakers flying we made good progress up the French and Belgian coasts and that evening we arrived in Ostend, our first foreign port. We were still on schedule to reach the Dutch island of Texel in time to watch the Rand Texel Beach Cat Race to be held on June the 10th. Although, as we had to sail over 150 miles in two days, we would need good winds and early starts to make it. Fortunately, leaving Ostend at 4.30 next morning, we had a fast sail in a wonderful following wind. In strong winds like this, we usually sailed downwind under spinnaker alone, as it makes sailing under autopilot a lot easier, yet it is only slightly slower. Sadly, the wind slowly moderated, and by hook, the entrance to Europort and Rotterdam, it was calm. Even with 30 ships crossing our path as they made for Rotterdam, Stuart still felt relaxed enough to doze. After a night stop in Scheveningen, we arrived off the entrance to Den Helder at the south end of the island, just as the first round Texel race boats crossed our path. It was perfect timing. Despite the haze and light winds, it was a magnificent sight as we watched 850 beach cats pass us by. We took a last look back at the passing fleet and then entered the marina when it was time to meet family and friends and to try and repair our electronic equipment which was already causing us major problems. After a couple of days rest we were off again. Rather than sail the offshore route towards the Kiel Canal 
we decided that it would be more interesting to sail amongst the narrow channels and sandbanks of the Wadensee, that stretch of water between New Wadden Island and the Dutch mainland, which is still home for hundreds of traditional Dutch yachts and fishing boats. That first night we anchored in what appeared to be the middle of nowhere but was actually carefully positioned at the edge of the channel so that we could dry out for the first time since leaving Plymouth, scrub the anti-fouling and remove the oil which had been staining our topsides since Southampton. And then we went off to stretch our legs. Sailing in such flat and shallow water was a new experience for Richard and Stuart. When the tide was out, the water completely disappeared. When it was in, all the sandbanks were covered. We had to learn the hard way that even with our shallow draught, we had to follow the widdies that marked the channels religiously, if we were not to go aground. A high pressure system had settled in the North Sea which meant that we either had strong northeasterly winds, which made filming impossible as we beat to windward through the narrow twisting channels, or we had flat calms when we motored. Sailing in these waters is, more than anywhere, dominated by the tides, as the watersheds behind each island are a critical point, for here the water is at its shallowest and the tidal streams change, so that when we judged it right, it seemed that we could sail swiftly on forever. With a schedule to meet, we had to keep pushing on, whatever the tide or wind, until finally we left Dutch waters and entered Borkum, the first German Wadensee island. After clearing customs, we tried to repair the autopilots, two of which had already stopped working. <laughs> what a load of junk. <laughs> Not a lot of Indians there. Despite resoldering and repairing the faults, the repairs only lasted a couple of hours before failing again, this time for good. By contrast to less than picturesque Borkum, Baltram, 40 miles further east, which we entered at dusk the next day after a long slow beat against the tide, was a delightful place and the harbour master and locals all made us welcome. Next morning we had to wait for the tide to rise before being able to leave Baltram and continue our journey east. We had some fast, exciting sailing in the flat water to the lee of the German islands, the area made famous in Erskine Childer's book, The Riddle of the Sands. The impression from the book is of a vast, desolate area, but in our case, our speed allowed us to pass the string of islands in a single tide, and so reached the Elbe estuary. Without electric autopilots, Stuart and Richard had to resort to hand steering or a string and shock cord self-steering system. With the tide under us and a following wind, we raced on up the Elbe to Brunsbuttle and the start of the Kiel Canal. The Kiel Canal is the busiest ship canal in the world. There are several locks. This is the small one, for yachts. At high water, the water levels between canal and sea are not very different, while the pontoons against the lock walls meant that we did not need to tend the warps as the water level dropped. Once clear of the lock, we motored into the marina for the night. 
yachts are not allowed to travel at night, nor stop in the canal. So, as the canal is 60 miles long, we needed an early start. As the day wore on, it became very hot. In fact, it became hot enough to melt the last working autopilot. So we decided that on our return trip we would stop at the Rendsburg Marina by this curious hanging bridge. Towards the end of the day we all began to suffer from heat exhaustion, aggravated by the long hours of hand steering and the incessant noise of the engines. But at last, 13 hours after leaving Brunsbottle, we arrived at the end of the canal and so had finally reached the Baltic and the end of phase one of our trip. Holtenau Marina is at the south end of the Kiel Fjord and we stayed two days in the marina, partly to recover from the canal and partly to stock up on food from Thiessens, the ship chandler. We carried plenty of spares and tools with us, but fortunately few were needed. The sewing machine was only used when I made a set of three courtesy flags for each of the eight countries on our route. The Danish islands are only a short distance from Kiel, and after a gentle day's sail we arrived at the sandy beach. There is no tide in the Baltic, so we were able to get in close to the shore. We rafted together and rigged a tent and discussed the routes for the next few days. Uh, there. Oh, there. Oh, well, I think we go there. Well, Richard was saying it's quite shallow. This is the same bit. It's just doing me stones, isn't it? Well, that is what is good about old charts and that sand. It's deep. Yeah. We had now sailed over 750 miles in close company and had begun to appreciate the attractions of sailing in convoy. For one thing, it was much safer as there were always two other boats in sight. For another, it was a lot of fun. All of the islands in the Great Belt are inhabited, which means that there are many bridges linking them. This was one of the longest that we passed under. Danish bridges are fixed and are usually less than 20 metres high, so large yachts cannot get through. But of course, with our 9 metre high masts, we had no problems. Denmark is our favourite Scandinavian country. The people are friendly and the landscape is more familiar to English eyes and the harsh rocks and fir trees found further north. It is certainly somewhere that we will sail to again, but sadly on this trip we had to push on and on Midsummer's Day, after only four days in Danish waters and without actually going ashore, we reached the eastern tip of Denmark and prepared for the crossing to Sweden. Our two Mercury engines were giving us constant trouble and so, while I made the Swedish courtesy flags, Stuart began dismantling his engine. This time he found that the fault was in the carburetor. By the end of the trip, Stuart had become an expert in outboard repair. Later that evening, some local multi-hull sailors invited us to a midsummer night party. Regretfully, we had to decline, as the next day we had a 70 mile crossing to southeast Sweden. After another dawn start, the wind gradually picked up from astern, and as we left the cliffs of Moan in the distance, we settled down to an exciting sail. Despite sailing under spinnakers alone, 
the DECA was showing that we were averaging over 10 knots. The biggest disaster of the trip occurred as we entered the tiny Swedish harbour of Brantevik when my engine blew up. Once dismantled, we discovered that it was beyond repair as the Conrad had broken and so I resigned myself to being towed whenever we had to motor. Although the Striders are simple boats, we always ate well. But on this occasion, I decided to make a meal of it. Can I put the controls in now? Yeah. After a 16 hour beat past Karlskrona and on round the Old Klippen Light to Sandham, a passage that was to prove one of the worst of the trip, the wind went round and increased still further and we had a very fast spinnaker run up the Öland Channel to the old fortress town of Kalmar. Richard raced ahead, still carrying his spinnaker, while Stuart and I sailed on on the reefed main and jib. Stuart had his lunch in comfort. I decided that it was not quite rough enough for Eilis. Even sailing at 17 knots on the spinnaker, Richard found that the strider would still sail itself with the radish lashed and very little spray came on board. Even so, lashed radars are not as good as the real thing and it was in Kalmar that he finally bought a new autopilot and so ended his 500 mile experiment with shock self-steering. Our stay in Kalmar was our last in the marina until we arrived at Helsinki for we were now approaching the archipelago where it would always be possible to find a safe island anchorage each night. Although each boat had good accommodation in the hulls, we preferred to live on deck under the cockpit tent. It only takes a few minutes to set up and forms a sheltered saloon where we could all relax together. We had now completed the passage making part of the trip and so had cause to celebrate. You don't get much for a pound, do you? <laughs> How far did you say we'd come today? Was it? Was this a thousand miles we've been? God save us. A thousand and three. Oh, sorry, Teddy. It's a thousand and three. Move over this way. Cheers for a thousand miles. May the next thousand be as happy as the first thousand. Next morning we sailed on and quite abruptly entered the archipelago proper. 
Immediately we were in a different world. The air changed and became heavily scented with pine and the subtler fragrances of shrubs and herbs. That night we found a perfect anchorage at Hamnenharm. I sailed in. Stuart and Richard followed under power. The lagoon had high rounded boulders on one side and, standing on top of them, we could look down at the boats and out over the string of islands and so study the next day's route. Unfortunately, the next day was calm and we had several hours of motoring before the sea breeze set in and we were able to turn off the engines and sail. Instead of sailing 60 or 70 miles a day, as we had until then, we were now able to take things easier. We were ahead of schedule and so only needed to sail about 20 miles a day for the next couple of weeks. The channel would sometimes narrow and even with a good sailing breeze, Richard or Stuart would have to take it in turns to tow my boat past small fishing villages and island holiday homes. Unlike England, where one sails all day alone and then enters a crowded harbour at night, in Scandinavia we found that we sailed all day amongst a steady stream of boats travelling in both directions and in the evenings always found a sheltered bay where we could tie up to the shore and have a meal in peace. There then followed one of those perfect days when the spinner cassettes would make an America's Cup skipper proud and even the cameraman could relax. So we sailed on, getting steadily nearer to Stockholm, past timber barges, classically styled Scandinavian yachts and seemingly thousands of modern yachts and powerboats. There are tens of thousands of rocky islands in the archipelago, mostly small the larger ones covered in fir trees and the nearer we got to Stockholm, summer houses. To our eyes it was a totally alien coastline, quite unlike anywhere else in the rest of Europe. For the next 400 miles to Helsinki we were to be rarely out at sea and away from the protection of the island chain. Despite being a rocky coastline, there are occasional sandy lagoons. We found this one on our last night in Sweden, some 25 miles north of Stockholm. As usual, we had flags to make and the log to write up before we set out to Mariham in the Åland Islands, which are an autonomous province of Finland, and at 60 degrees was to be the furthest north that we would go. In the past, the 20 mile crossing of the Gulf of Bothnia used to confuse navigators for the compass variation can be as great as 30 degrees or more. Fortunately our decker kept us on course and at 2 p.m. the Orland Islands came in sight and we could hoist the Finnish flags and enter Mariham past the old wooden lighthouse and the steel-hulled pommon, the island's famous symbol. <laughs> 
after two days seeing the sights, we went on again. We found Finland to be more rugged than Sweden, which is not really surprising since the whole area is frozen over in winter. In fact, Finland is the only country in the world without an ice-free port in winter. If the winter is particularly severe, it is even possible to walk the whole route we were sailing from Sweden through the Finnish islands and across the Gulf of Finland to Tallinn itself. Now, of course, it was mid-July and we were always able to find a shelter, even if it was windy. Today we rounded up behind an island and found a large lagoon where dozens of yachts were sheltering from the strong southerly wind. This far north, the water in the Baltic is almost fresh. Indeed, the locals claim that in some places it is possible to drink it, but we never did more than use it for washing clothes. The day merged one into the other as we slowly drifted along through the Orland Islands towards mainland Finland. We were discovering that sailing small boats in company is a great way to see the world. Being small, the striders are easy to handle single-handed, and being fast, we could sail long distances each day. We seemed to be sailing in perpetual daylight, never seeing the sun rise or set, however long we were at sea. It had still not rained since the Solent, but then one day we saw clouds gather in the distance, so donned our oilskins, but the rain squalled past as safely as stern, leaving us in glorious sunshine and a following wind. Although the Satnav and Decker were proving to be very reliable, with so many rocks around and with such clear visibility, most of the real navigation was done through the binoculars. Eventually we passed through the Orland Island chain and reached Hanko at the southwest tip of mainland Finland. It was only 50 miles from here to Helsinki and the waters got ever more crowded with motorboats which swerved and skittered past us on the plain at 25 knots, sometimes only a few feet away. At last, on July the 19th, we arrived at Helsinki and joined the fleet of yachts preparing for the trip to Tallinn. We were almost ready to go, so had time for a quick game of snooker. Go. Hey, I did it! I did it! No. Okay, in here. By now, flag making had become a ritual. While Stuart made the hammer and sickle from a mixture of custard powder and paint, I made the Estonian national flag, for of course Tallinn is the capital of Estonia, one of the Soviet republics. Estonia had just been opened to the west and dozens of yachts were making the 40 mile crossing to Tallinn. To simplify customs clearance in Tallinn, we were each given an arrival time. Ours was 11am, so we had to make a dawn start. 
It was a proud moment when we could hoist the Russian courtesy flags and then, as the coast of Estonia came in sight, the wind went round and we had a fast spinnaker reach right up to the harbour entrance itself. We entered Tallinn's yacht harbour, Perita, site of the boycott at 1980 Olympics, under the watchful eye of a Russian patrol boat. As we had arrived on time, clearing customs was quick and efficient and we were soon able to move into the marina and moor up with the rest of the rally fleet. We had sailed 1,447 miles to get to Tallinn in 51 days and so we sat down to tell the world that we had arrived. With marks on it? Yeah. Oh, God. Poser. Certainly. Yachting World, have I got an address for that? After a guided tour of Tallinn and a reception in the town hall, it was time for the traditional exchange of gifts and virgies between the visiting clubs. My name is Stuart Fisher of the Catamaran and Trimaran Multi-Hull Offshore Cruising and Racing Association of the United Kingdom. <laughs> We are a very small organisation, <laughs> but we take care to have a very large name. <laughs> Our three boats have come from England, and we bring the greetings of all multi-hull sailors in England to all multi-hull sailors and other sailors in your country. And we would like to give you these small tokens of our presence in the hope that in future years more and more multi hulls will come here to visit you and will meet more and more of your own multi hulls. Thank you. During our stay in Tallinn, the wind had been a strong northerly and we had been dreading the beat back to Finland. However, when it came to leave, the wind had dropped and we sailed across a calm sea and through some familiar channels to tie up to some rocks and to hear another extract from Stuart's journal. Now reduced to two engines between three boats, one operating autopilot made up by Richard under the ASP label, all spare parts, one English autopilot bought new in Kiel but not functioning reliably or accurately, and only one working trailing log. Although it had still not rained while we were actually sailing, as we beat out to Uto, a remote island fortress on the outer Finnish Skerries, the weather was clearly on the change, as the wind continued to rise. To save an extra 10 miles beating to windward, we decided to enter Uto through the back door, so to speak, and so are very glad that our charts showed every rock. The resulting gale lasted three days, so we had to get special permission from the military authorities to stay longer than the regulation 48 hours. days later the wind went round to the north and we had one of the best sails of the trip back through the Stockholm archipelago. <laughs> <laughs> 
At last, only two days behind the schedule decided before we left Plymouth, we reached the entrance to the Gotha Canal, which would lead us 160 miles across the heart of Sweden to Gothenburg. There are 58 locks in the canal, which fortunately were just large enough to take all three striders. Each one raised us about 8 feet, and in total we climbed more than 300 feet above sea level. Walking the boats up through the locks was very hard work. Going down was to prove easier. Stuart always went first and had to work hard to keep the warps tight as the water rushed in and the boats rose. The rush of water at the back of the lock was much reduced and so Richard was able to film. We motored each day through peaceful, unspoiled countryside, with never a town in sight, sometimes emerging from an obvious man-made stretch into a shallow, reed-lined lake or part of an old river. Although only half of the canal is man-made, we learnt that it still took over 7 million man-days to build over a period of 20 years, and we wondered whether today's engineers could build a canal that would last as long. One major feature on the route is the famous flight of seven locks at Berg, situated at the west end of Lake Roxen, a large shallow lake that we reached on our third day in the canal. We had plenty of time to study these 175 year old locks as we had to wait for a ferry to make its way down. It took an hour to pass through the locks and then it was our turn to make our way up the 60 foot rise. We discovered that the Goethe Canal is something of an anachronism. Apart from the ferries carrying tourists, it has no commercial traffic. Instead, hundreds of yachts use it as a shortcut from the west to the east coasts of Sweden. It is only open during the summer months, as it has to be drained in winter to prevent ice damaging the locks. Although the canal dues were high, the price did include the mooring fees each night. The days may have been peaceful, apart from the incessant drone of the engines, but the nights were always noisy. The moorings were either next to railway lines, main roads or alongside busy quays, thronged with holiday makers. The majority of the locks are now hydraulically operated, but occasionally the old manual locks are still used and we all had to lend a hand in opening the gates. Unfortunately, Richard had had to be towed ever since the start of the canal, as the water impeller on his engine had failed, and it was not until we arrived at Motala, halfway through the canal, that we were able to get spares for it, and also fit a new propeller for Stuart's engine. Motala is on the shores of Lake Vatten, the deepest lake in Sweden. As we motored out, Independently for once, the wind picked up 
and we had a good 20 mile sail across the lake. Batten is the home of the famous Saab Began Canard fighter and a steady stream of these planes roared overhead all day. Lake Patton led into an eerie stretch of canal where the canal passed across the large shallow lake and a line of decayed collapsing stone bollards and a towpath straggled across the water, completely cut off from the nearest land. Progress through the canal was depressingly slow. We had hoped to pass through in eight days, but it was to take ten. Although there were almost no other yachts using the canal, we were now out of season, and the locks and bridges were only manned by part-time volunteers, and we often had frustrating delays while we waited for the lock keeper to arrive. But at last we were on our way down to leave the canal and entered the largest lake in Sweden, Lake Venen. This lake is huge and is more of an inland sea than a lake for despite only crossing the southwest corner of it, it took us two days. In fact, we had a very rough sail in the strongest winds of the trip to Lasco Castle, where we stayed until the wind moderated. Next day, the sun had come out and we had a gentle sail to Venersborg and the Trollhattan Locks, which would lead us to the Gotha River and the sea. The locks in the Gotha Canal hark back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The Trollhattan locks were clearly much more modern and an awe-inspiring engineering feat. It had taken 58 locks to climb to this height, but only five were needed for the descent. The locks are cut into the side of the cliff and as we sank gently down we looked up at the rocks overhead and marvelled at the work involved in making them and the power of the water that the gates held back. The 40 mile motor down the Gotha River from the Trollhattan Locks to Gothenburg started in a flat calm and finished with us motoring into a 30 knot headwind and frequent squally showers. Even with the current under us, our speed was down to three knots, so the trip took much longer than we had expected, and we were on our last dregs of fuel when we finally arrived. After the night spent in the marina, we motored out past the icebreakers and the city of Gothenburg. It was now August the 16th, and we had a very hard 400 mile sail back through Denmark to the Kiel Canal. As we entered the Elbe, storm force winds were forecast and so we decided to cross northwest Germany to Holland by way of the Haldinger Canal instead of sailing back through the Wadensee. Entering the canal meant passing through a tunnel in the dike and so we had to lower the masts which meant that we would not be able to sail again on the trip. Once through the dike, we were able to motor on, well sheltered despite the gale. The German canal system is, not surprisingly, super efficient, and despite the many low bridges that needed opening and several locks, we felt pleased with our progress when that evening we tied our boats to a couple of fence posts. <laughs> 
Early the next morning we passed through the smallest and narrowest lock of the whole trip to reach Bremerhaven and De Weser. Faced with a 20 mile sea crossing and no masts, we were glad that the sea was smooth and a wind light. Unfortunately, the previous day's mood was soon to evaporate, for this was the one stretch of the trip where we did not have a chart, which led to the obvious result that we missed a channel. But not by very much. We had run aground at high water, and it seemed that the water would never come back. But of course it did, and we soon made our way to the next lock at Milhamshaven which was by far the biggest lock we had seen. In fact, the German Navy built it to take their aircraft carriers. We even saw a couple of super tankers in the inner harbour that had obviously used the lock. The size of the lock was emphasised as we left, for we found a repair team working actually inside the lock gate itself. We were now in the Ems Yarder Canal, where the bridges are really low, but once we had cut off the flagstaffs, we could just squeeze through. Then, finally, after a hundred days at sea, the White Lamb windmill at the entrance to my parents' house came in sight and we were able to tie up the boats to the bank of the canal and leave them for the winter. Later we had the boats delivered home by road, ready for our next summer's racing and cruising, but that's another story.